Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to Montreal for the first time in my life. I'm very, very jet lagged, so if I start speaking Russian or any other kind of languages, that's the reason why. Anyway, I'm very happy to be here uh, for several reasons. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the idea of hexagram is pretty challenging. I'm about to build up a similar institute in Moscow and Warsaw, so it's, I'm very curious about my workshop and the uh, experience I will have with you guys these few days I'm here. Fortunately, I'm only here till Saturday, so I hope at least my jet lag is not getting too bad. Anyway, uh, thank you for this amazing introduction. It sounds very um, impressive. I hope my talk will impress you less than the introduction. <laughs> I try to be a little bit more modest than the introducers. So, um, <laughs> yes, so the introduction was then uh, also what is sense of smell concern. I guess you all have some clues in this is what it's all about. And we have amazing people in this city who have done amazing uh, investigations into the senses. And yes, I am uh, one person maybe the only one who decided to change my life and use my nose for that purpose. So here are all the facts you already heard. And uh, yes, I see smell not just as uh, something abstract that surrounds us full time, all the time. Smell is very important information for the purpose of communication, <laughs> navigation, and decision making, memory, etc., etc. So off I went in the beginning of the 90s. I mean, having said that, I got tired of having primarily to operate after the look of things. After having stu studied chemistry and several other disciplines, I didn't know where I was heading. I knew I was heading somewhere. And the most important thing were, was that I was probably he heading upwards, meaning trying to take care of the invisibility that surround me full time, all the time. So trying to find a profession that somehow give me direction in that direction was not easy. So at the beginning of the 90s, there existed hardly any kind of um, yeah, work done in the field of smell, except for perfumery and, and etc. So off I went doing field work for seven years, literally putting my nose into everything. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to find out if by using the nose <coughs> would my life change? Would I be more capable of understanding the surrounding that I live in? And also appreciate life in a different way. As we all know, smell doesn't start with the way we look or the way we sound. It starts with the smell. Tolerance is a key point, key word in my work. So this is the way I collected up to 7,000 smell from reality over a period of seven years. The reason for doing this was, first of all, to see, can I remember all these smells? All these smells became my diary. Instead of writing a diary, I collected a smell that represented time and geography in my life over seven years. And every box here had a, 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 a label telling all the necessary information I needed to go on with this work. So is the date, where did I find the smell, and what would I call it if there potentially would be a language? Why did I choose this smell to represent what in my life? So inside these boxes are actual real stuff. So there's a source, so I always found the source. The source is, so to say, the key point of the smell. The smell always had to come from something. So on these boxes, you see sometimes on black points, I develop a device that enables me to go back and smell the smells again and again and again until I had so much knowledge about the smell that I would never forget it. And as we all know, smell and memory is very efficient. Two synapses, you trigger the subconsciousness and your emotion, and memory of smell lasts so much longer than any other kind of memory. And unfortunately, we only use maximum 20% of all this amazing smell memory. I wanted to see if I could change this. So this library primarily had a function of learning me to test my nose, to see what my nose knows I could do. 
in addition to learning about smells and to see, uh, for me it was very important to see if I could be able to relate to smell rationally rather than emotionally. And I can say today that is the case. I can go into situations where other people throw up and throw, go crazy. For me, I only think, wow, that's amazing smell. <laughs> if I have the components wood, I need to re re reproduce that specific smell. And this is very interesting. And we never learn to think like this. We never learn to use our noses like this. There's nowhere in our society you know, where we can learn about chemistry of smell and the nose. No curriculum, no in schools, no kindergarten, nowhere. I wanted to change this. So in addition to going through all this, I also um, uh, wanted to see if I could get rid of my prejudices. And I did develop several methodologies how to do that. Um, after seven years of training, I was ready to become a missionary of the nose. Of course, the industry got very curious. This is a little bit later, 2004. Before that, I was uh, renting myself into different chemistry labs all over the world, doing projects that were sponsored by different companies. This, at that time, this company was the biggest provider of smell and taste molecules in the world. And they offered me a job. And I said, no, I don't want to work for you, but maybe you'd like to collaborate with me. So I wanted to have my own laboratorium. I wanted the access to all the knowledge and the know-how of the industry. And I dedicated myself to this company since 2004. Having done that, my life changed. So here I had access to, for example, Headspace, which is the device that enable one to collect smell molecules in, in reality, here is an example how that is used in the industry, primarily to copy molecules of all coming from volatiles in nature to reproduce, let's say, smell of a rose to make cheaper ingredients. This is my laboratorium, <coughs> consisting of 7,000 components, primarily chemical components, which is for me very important in the process of simulation. When you have a natural components already have kind of identification or have a smell and you can immediately direct the smell. So this is me working in my lab. I will take you into a couple of the main kind of works I've been doing over these years. So I'm pretty famous for my city smell projects. And these projects are done for several reasons, for, for different purposes, and for different uh, clients and, and uh, countries, and etc. Not just because I have nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. So these are the cities I've been literally putting my nose into, walking around, being a dog for years. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I will take you into how I work. I go into a neighborhood, I identify a neighborhood using primarily my nose. I do this several times of the day, reassuring that the smell is not just a whiff of a second, but a real thing that's part of that specific site, that specific neighborhood, that specific situation. And if the situation and if the money and budget allow it, I go back also several times a year several times over years to reassure that this is really part of the identity. If I'm able to, these are different cities, this is Mexico City, this is Detroit, <laughs> Kuwait, Kansas, Istanbul, Liverpool, Kansas, Cape Town, Mexico City. If the situation allowed it, that I can bring the source to my lab, I do. If it doesn't, oh sorry, here I will show, this is the first time I show the first phase of a research in a museum. This was on display, uh, it just over, it just finished yesterday in Tokyo. <coughs> I built up a smell scale, uh, one phase, uh, phase one in, in, in uh, Tokyo, so I collected 220 smells in different neighborhoods in Tokyo over three weeks. 
So in these boxes, you have the real source of the smell. There is no even indicator what the smells are. There are only numbers. And on the map, there are numbers that is the same as on the boxes. People were asked to comment on what's in the boxes, or what are the smells, or where they potentially come from. And they put all these comments on the invisible map here. So this is kind of the invisible map of Tokyo, which is then the starting point for the second phase of the research. So this is the first time I've ever shown the phases of research in the, museum, in the context of an exhibition. Normally this take place, and it's just take, I only have all the material for the next step done in my lab. So if I don't have the source, I go in with Headspace technology, which is looking like this. This device allows me to bring it with me wherever I can. And it collects on the tenex, it collects the molecules that come out of a situation. So here are different Headspace sampling all over the world. This is the Mississippi River. This is catfish from that river. <laughs> that catfish, my assistant, threw up and was in bed for two days. That's the catfish literally ate garbage. Oh my god, I couldn't believe it. I followed that catfish from the fish to the to the cat to the catfish burger. <laughs> so the petrol station around the corner from Missouri, Missouri uh, Mississippi River. Uh, Mississippi, Missouri, sorry. And all my children. <coughs> So research phase number three, this small tenexes, I call it my camera for the invisible. This kind of a film or, or, or a glass tube go directly to the big lab in the US, IFF R&D, and the analyses are done in this bigger part of the gasometrography, the headspace, which IFF take care of. So here you have then the analyses of my smellscapes, as you see, there are much more molecules in reality than I'm able to identify through this technology. But nevertheless, these peaks allowed me to get a kind of imagination and also knowledge about what kind of ingredients is. Here's the identification of those peaks. Mm. And with those kind of information, I go then into the next step, which is the process of replication. So the, the, the components in the reality, the molecules in reality, are then replaced with chemical components. And my knowledge in chemistry allowed me then to do, because in general, these components are meant to cover up reality. What I do is to show the same reality with the same ingredients, which is per se and paradox. But nevertheless, since I'm around, this company have also allowed me to have access to the storage of amazing molecules that didn't necessarily smell good enough for the purpose. And uh, my knowledge in chemistry allowed also uh, make me able to, did, to make combinations of molecules so that I can enlarge the amount of ingredients that I have to my disposal. Just a moment, I need to have some sugar. <laughs> so here I'm composing a smell. This is the process. And we work with nano units, and it's very important to be precise. And also, I will show it tomorrow in the workshop the necessity of being clean and sober. If you have one nano unit too much in one of these smells, it turns to be something completely different. So, to be precise is the first <coughs> rule. And also, because we have in mind here in my lab to reproduce these smells endlessly for the purpose to understand them. <coughs> so here I will show a couple of city smellscape products. What do I do with all these smells in the end of the day? This is the city of uh, Kansas City, Kansas City, Missouri, two different states in Kansas and Missouri. I was funded by the Hallmark Foundation to do a project in Kansas City, Missouri. And I added Kansas City, <coughs> Kansas in addition to this because I thought this is too boring. Kansas City, Missouri is KCM is very kind of typical middle midwest american city and uh, yeah was for me not enough interesting so they accepted me adding the uh, neighbor city and it made the project 
incredible. So here is my version of that, that map. I develop different, uh, different uh, tools. So what I did was to locate it. I located several sites where there were permanent smells. I made a map so that people could go out, those ones who didn't have a smartphone could do it analog, collect the smell, contribute with language, and every neighborhood I've been working in had a map that indicated where you could, could potentially find a smell, but not necessarily exact where. So what was fantastic here? These neighborhoods and this part of the world in general, when I came, I was offered three cars and seven assistants. So I listen, but I'm walking around smelling. I cannot take a car. <laughs> yes, but people are killing each other here. You have guns at every corner. <laughs> say, yeah, but then I go home. You know? <laughs> anyway, so they provided me with local uh, people and also some areas I had a escort for police. But it was fantastic. This became a kind of community project. People made pathways to walk around and find smells, and school kids were out there getting parents come along, <coughs> and we were smelling, and crossing the bridge. Some people, in, the people living in each other city, for the first time ever, started to visit each other. And there was no hierarchy, there was no uh, rules that says this is right and this is wrong. What was counting here was that you find a smell and all the smells were interesting, never mind what. So here we are in the Missouri River. This is the headquarter where I showcased all the different parts of the research. <coughs> we had, I had a smell molecule bar which then where I broke up some of the smells to the different ingredients and made these, so to say, the city smells accessible for everyone and you could literally compose your own different, own city smell. <coughs> 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 this is the app, real time, in the headquarter. So whenever somebody was out in the field finding a smell, the nose in the middle was clicking, and on the, on the right side, the, con the contribution of words done by the people were popping up. Next room here, we had those words coming, coming up as a rap. So this guy was singing together with people out in the field words around city smells. And in the end of five months, this play, we donated a golden nose to those who had the most points. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I made my nose golden. And uh, the winner was uh, a lady that lived on the street and she never thought that she would ever have any function. So it's quite, quite amazing. This is another project <coughs> which don't exist anymore. It was fortunately destroyed at MoMA. But this was my first ever city smell project done over four years in Berlin. And here are the elements that I was analyzing. These are the streets and the area of Berlin that I put my nose into. This is East Berlin. So by decontextualis decontextualization of the city, putting this city into a context where you normally wouldn't find it, I managed to get attention to, in this case, neighborhoods that never ever would be interesting <coughs> for other purposes than, you know, maybe uh, some hamburger or maybe some uh, whatever Turkish food. But the city beyond the way it looked and sound, this this enabled people to get curious, and then after having got access to this part of the city, maybe go back and also go back to that area for to find the smells. So this is Neukölln, south of Berlin. This is south and east Berlin. This is uh, West Berlin. So in these bottles, there is a message. This is not just a nice bottle. There's hardcore reality smells, place the beautiful bottles, so meaning I get a lot of attention, but people smell, they freak out, but mission accomplished because that is the point. <coughs> Normally in the world we live, in those bottles, there is hardly any message. We buy the bottle, we, we, we love the bottles, and uh, yeah, that's about it. North, northwest, northeast, west-south, north-south, east-west, 
not so this was. <laughs> and this is Berlin in the bottle. This work was on display in MoMA, um, talked to me uh, two years ago, and uh, it was very popular, but nobody was allowed to smell it. <laughs> Unfortunately, in museums these days, we are not allowed to do anything other than looking. I mean, in spite of that the world is changing in all aspects, I think mean, that's a shame. And this was, in this, in this case, my, my problem. I was commissioned to do this project, or to show this project, and I was happy about it, but I was, I was uh, making sure that I'm not just doing nice bottles, I also have some smells in those bottles. And even MoMA was asking, but actually, what's inside that bottle? Is it colored water? I said, you must be kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so in the end of the day, this was not accessible for anyone. Only at the opening, I managed to make a solution or application that made it accessible for the visitors. MoMA promised me to take out this application on and off, but obviously they never did. So a month before the <coughs> exhibition was taken down, one guy got so curious, so furious, he couldn't smell, so he broke, he took the bottle north-south, grabbed it out of, of the wall, causing the three bottles in the north fell down, it made Moa smell like Ryan Nikodov Berlin for, for the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Moa called me up and said, listen, Cecil didn't do this. I said, yeah, of course I did. But anyway, I declared the work completely destroyed. I had a shortage for a fortune. I had a lawyer that absolutely argued in my favor, and Moma paid without blinking. <laughs> so I guess it has, a, a, I don't know. <coughs> Positive or negative that I have no clue what smells in museums. <laughs> the work don't exist anymore. And the worst was during the, the flood in New York, this work was at Momo's insurance company in the basement, so I think it just got even worse destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> this is a project I did for eight years uh, with Harvard GSD, Mexico City. It's a project about pollution and awareness. So <clears throat> I showed a couple of slides. This is the city. This is the pollution and smell of Mexico City. I went into 221 neighborhoods over seven years and collected smells and tried to break down, uh, you know, to a couple of smells representing each of the neighborhood. Of course, this is a subjective take on, on a city, a quadrant of a city or whatever, and I don't predict that that's the only way the city smells, just to have said that. So here, the smell project is on display at Harvard GSD. I got the award for this project, uh, the conference, and um, here in all these cases, and this this is uh, a lot of a language. So every smell I do, I bring back, I reproduce, I bring back to the people with whom I was looking for the smell with. In the case of this project. And when the reproduced smell is ready, I ask people to contribute with one word. I developed several methodology how to trigger people to not think too much, but give me a spontaneous word towards a smell. And it's amazing what the outcomes are. So I collect all those words and make a system out of them and analyze them and compare them and come up with new terms for <coughs> different smells and that's what you saw on the wall, together with already existing terms I found in different Aztec languages. So all my projects have one aspect of language. I try to see if, in spite of English, uh, Anglo-American languages, that there are lots of, of languages that have existing terminologies and expressions towards smell and smelling. <coughs> So this is the D and GSD. <laughs> I made a silent movie showing people smelling pollution, 21 hours. So you can see the different noses, talking nose. Here you have all the languages again on display in different part of public buildings. And here are the different dictionaries in each of the public buildings. So what do I do with this kind of price? beyond showing it in, let's say, university or museum. This is reality. This is my version of that reality. This is another reality. This is my version of that reality. 
these molecules I give to children and I say, please, try to understand, let's say in this case, pollution on the presbytery of the nose. If you understand it that way, how would you react? What is the difference between seeing an image of the same and smelling the same? And the kids are working, and the kids are composing, and the kids are coming with comments about pollution, which is astonishing. So this is what I do a lot. I try to do this workshop with grown-ups. I gave up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really like that. The, the issue of prejudices is enormous. The earlier you can start to change, the better <coughs> the results. So I do a lot with children because they have already the senses are so alert and they have so little prejudices. Here are other workshops. The World Science Festival in New York. Three years ago, I was on a panel on chemistry <coughs> and smell. And I managed to get uh, the IFF with me on the street in Columbia, Park, Columbia uh, Circle <laughs> at um, NYU at the park. There's one last day of the World Science Festival is dedicated to science for children. So we set up a laboratorium only for children, and no parents were allowed to come across. <laughs> and I showed a lot of smells I've been collecting at the Chinatown and the area around NYU, and gave it to the children. Now this boy is smelling garbage. Does it look like he's smelling garbage? No. But as soon as his parents come and say, listen, my God, little boy, don't smell, this is dirty. The fun thing was, the more dirty, the more real those smells were, the more fun the kids had. If I come up with a rose or a lemon or whatever, the kids say, oh, it's like my toothpaste, it's like my this, oh, I know, they're just boring. <laughs> so again, you know, the sooner you can influence the kids, <coughs> get different influence. So this is the Midwest of the U.S. with my uh, city smell project. <coughs> Every morning we had a bus with seven assistants. We went out to 250 schools in four weeks, four months. These are the cards of the different areas. <coughs> These are kids, and all is about smell and language contribution. <laughs> <coughs> so these are all, these are amazing. These kids are the first drawing this boy ever made in his life. This, the school of disabled, and this boy had, couldn't even speak. So this drawing was for me, I, I couldn't believe it. So this is sewage, he smelled sewage, and he read this drawing in two seconds. He never ever wrote anything, never made a drawing in his life. So this is another group of works, which I've been uh, doing for years, and still doing. In uh, 2006, I was commissioned by MIT to do something around uh, the census and new technology, Media Lab and the, the gallery there. <coughs> and I was curious to see, can I smell that a person is afraid and is, you know, paranoid of a kind? And this was during the Bush government and all the notion around uh, paranoia and terrorism in the U.S. specifically. And uh, it's... I was just curious to see if I actually could pick up that smell and reproduce it. So I got access to 21 uh, serious uh, uh, phobic, uh, ser uh, serious suffering phobic man. I started to work with a psychiatrist and a psychologist, and that's how I got access to this man. And they develop, I developed a device that enabled me to collect the body sweat at, this, at the fear attack. And this device became a kind of talisman for these guys. They just, whenever they carried with them, they felt like safe. Nevertheless, I copied um, 21 men, and this is the reality. This is a <laughs> normal, normal <laughs> photo you find on the web. You say, smell human, that's what pops up. <laughs> this is my reality. So here, I replicated the body sweat and I turned it into a nanotechnology called touch and smell. And at that technology, I placed the uh, reproduced smell in a binder that enabled it to stay on the wall. So what you do, you touch the wall and it releases the body sweat. And it's amazing. The wall becomes a metaphor for the skin and you react immediately. This was fantastic. 
And in MIT, there was a woman that came on her way to work every morning. She passed by guy number one, and she kissed him up and back and forth. And she's like, oh my god, when I'm in front of him, this feels so safe. You know? So it became a very interesting uh, psychological community. <laughs> and in these cases, I always worked with, with different scientists. Like here, we, uh, we had a psychologist that followed the project and looked into it from his perspective, etc. So here, um, the project went to, among others, to Beijing. <coughs> and this is the case in Beijing. People couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> they loved it, and it was like lined up, lined around the corner to get into this room. And, um, and also, because in a museum, for example, you're not allowed to touch, you're not allowed to do anything. So in addition to, I mean, to having the sensation of smelling a, a, a message, you know, you're also allowed to touch things and, and, and get other senses and other... So here is a project I did <coughs> around identity. I developed a fabric. I mean, besides you all have heard about these t-shirt projects that everybody tried to do. In this case, I tried to I develop a fabric, uh, a very specific fabric with sensors that collected the smell molecules on the body uh, amaz ama amazingly. So these students were not allowed to use any perfumes or any scented products for a week. And the smell, the t-shirts were smelling incredibly. So then, at the workshop, they were asked to give comments um, to each other on writing on the t-shirt, <coughs> what they were smelling. And then I had a whole set of molecules. They were supposed to try to build up some of these body smellscapes on their own. And again, it's not about right or wrong, and if it was working or not. The fact that I just gave this access to this new medium was here the sense. You know, instead of ABC, one, two, three, this is smell, component smell, chemical components. So another uh, way the ID uh, project or body uh, project went on was the world biggest and most luxurious perfume fair in the world in Florence is a really high M. They paid me 25,000 euro to sit around and spend, speak about body sweat. <laughs> <laughs> so, if nothing else, then, you know, this is better than to have a commercial gallery that don't sell anything. <laughs> um, so, they are speaking about body sweat. So, the fun thing is that people are coming up, oh, but this is amazing. Why don't you make perfume from it? I said, but if this is how you smell, why do you, why do you need a perfume? <laughs> so the whole discussion went in that kind of all kind of direction, which was fantastic. So I dared to put myself in context where you would never think you would put yourself, maybe in the beginning of your career. <coughs> but having you know been so solid in my knowledge, it's no border for where I can put myself. So this is the body sweats. Here you can touch the guy number eight. Here you can wash yourself with guy number five. <laughs> and there is a body lotion of guy number five as well. So this soap was made. I talked at the World Congress of Detergent in Germany, Hanover, last year. And during my talk, Henkel, maybe you all know who is. This is a detergent company. They made this soap for me. <laughs> body sweat. And they call me every day and say, Sizzle, but, but I think it's too strong, it's too strong, it's too strong. I say, yeah, it should be strong. <laughs> During my talk, I had a sink on my stage asking the CEOs of Procter & Gamble, Henkel, and you know, all these big companies to come on stage and wash themselves with my soap. So they came and they washed themselves and said, yeah, it's smelling sweat. I said, yes, it does. <laughs> maybe through your product you'll remove too much of yourself. So this is just a reminder, maybe you should put something of yourself back on yourself. <laughs> Not justify for washing our floor with the Granny Smith, you know. Maybe we should wash our floor with body sweat. <coughs> smell have a function. Anyway, this this regard to sweat smells shows up in so many aspects of life. So here you have a magazine. <coughs> Instead of having pictures, you have empty pages. You touch the page and you release the body sweat of a man. And this magazine functions as a boyfriend for a boyfriend of mine. <laughs> he sleeps with one of these guys every night. <laughs> and it's amazing. It does 
alternative to be alone, why not? Mm. It's just trying to find different solutions of quality of life. <laughs> Another <laughs> body project I was doing, this is a um, museum of modern art in San Francisco. They did the first ever exhibition around wine. I was uh, invited to take part. I said, yeah, but wine bottles are nice, but what's inside is more interesting. I would like to drink a bottle of wine. Okay, but then you have to have the bottle of wine, which is this one. $2,500 was sent to me from Sydney. I drank it. This is part of, my, uh, of the formula. I drank it over seven hours <laughs> and did not get drunk. It's funny. When you do things for, for science, you, you, you just do it with so much passion. That <laughs> so this is my mouth. This is breaking up. And this is reproduction. And this is my mouth on display in MoMA. And the technology I used here is like you breathe into my mouth and you release my mouth smell with the wine. And MoMA bought a piece. It's my mouth is on display forever. So, wow, not bad. But the fun thing was the Herald Tribune reviewed this piece. They didn't review the smell or any chemistry. They reviewed the people walking up and smelling in the hole. How they were like reassuring that nobody see them putting liquid, putting their head into somebody's mouth. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Like a lady was like walking up and looking around and putting her <gasps> in the back end. So it settled up. <laughs> anyway, so this is going more and more fun, guys. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a resident who happened to be having a <coughs> resident at Harvard Medical School paired up with synthetic biology and microbiology and system biology for a purpose around life. What is life? The necessity of bacteria. <coughs> and having done all these body projects over years, I was a kind of a specialist in the field. And as we all know, we speak about body, it very often gets compared with the smell of cheese or vice versa. So I wanted to take that to the next step. So here are the different bacteria you find in the different part of the body. This is cheeses, different part of cheeses. It was hard to find all these amazing cheeses from Europe at Cambridge, but we got special delivery uh, to, to, through Harvard, and so we got access to quite smelly cheeses. So this is bacteria you find in different cheeses. So we started to compare this, and then we uh, broke down some of the cheese bacteria, put it on plates, and gave it to people, and asked them to describe the smell. We didn't say what was on the plates. Just to, to have it clear, the comp comparison with the body. So here, on behalf of that, to make a long story short, uh, we started to collect human bacteria. We had donors within Harvard that gave us their favorite human bacteria. And uh, here we got raw milk, which is pretty illegal in the US. But nevertheless, we got raw milk and we, so to say, used the bacteria to ferment cheese. And this is the incubator. This is my nose cheese. We just finished a residence at Science Gallery in Trinity, Trinity University in Dublin, where we did continue this project. We got big donors to give us uh, their favorite human bacteria, like uh, Michael Pollan from New York Times, Bill Gates, Olaf Eliasson, mm -hmm. etc. And the project is again about showing the invisible. Here we show the necessity and the how a bacteria can be good. When we speak about bacteria, we normally think it's something negative. So this is a project around turning the notion, and that's necessary. If we one day should see, I mean, we know that bacteria is so important for our uh, immunity system, and the microorganism that we have is absolutely being ignored for far too long. So this project is about this. So here we have the different donors, uh, uh, and we put on plate, we grew some of the bacteria. And here you will see amazing cheeses. Cheese making. These are the different cheeses. And we made a film where we interviewed all the donors and the issues uh, and the questions in the film and to the to interviewers was also if one day you would have to contribute 
to the world, <coughs> giving you, donating your bacteria, would that cheese be yours? Is that your cheese or who does the cheese belong to? <laughs> <laughs> so this is Olaf Eliasson. This is Hans Olaf Obrecht. Jürgen Meyer X. Inga Drasset. Bill Gates. Michael Pollan. Etc. <coughs> I have clients. I am working in between research, creativity, and commercial world. And these people, they pay my bill, so to say. <laughs> the uh, Olympics in London, Adidas was Adidas was the main sponsor. I worked with Adidas for <coughs> six years. I got access to David Beckham's dirty sneakers, <laughs> and I found amazing <coughs> molecules, amazing molecules caused by the same bacteria that make this cheese. So this is the bacteria, and this is the making of the cheese, and this is the Adidas Becker <laughs> cheese for the Olympics in London, and this is a volunteer that ate the cheese in front of everyone. Why not? As soon as you put words in it, people freak out. But do you guys know what you're eating every day? <laughs> Maybe you should think about it. It's not that bad. Here's another client that have guys. For the Venice Biennale in, in, uh, in, in Venice, I made a table and it looked like a car. So this is the, it's 21 meter. And there are different reasons for eating. It's about political food, especially in Italy. Here are breaking up food only to smell molecules and taste molecules. Like you could call and eat uh, a whole meal. So normally eating and talking is not allowed. So here you eat your own uh, fear. So different application for eating, etc. <coughs> Another way uh, I use smell. So one aspect of my work is the, the simulation, replication of smells from reality. Second part of my work is to look into those amazing molecules I have there in my laboratory room and maybe give them codes, give these smells codes of different types. What I mean by that is like, if you just look at gas, gas don't smell. So once upon a time, somebody put three molecules on the top of gas to make it identifiable. Whenever you smell that smell, you think and you know it's gas. So this is what I mean with coding system. This project was done with the Reuters and Lund University quite quite long time ago. I wanted to see if you do, a pro, you know, this case it was about news. So these 398 abstract smell molecules have no references at all. In my lab, I have so many smells that I never ever smell in my entire life, and I'm not 20. Uh, I'm not two years anymore, yeah, or 20, whatever. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, in terms of you smell and then you have reference because the first time you smell, the, the reference is always the first one. So this is here smells that are abstract with no references. I give the reference. So I made a software, so the news came in, it condensed the news down to one reference, one code, that code activate the molecule, and you listen to the news in the context of a smell molecule. And we were testing how much do you remember of the news in the context of a smell and how much without. Astonishing. So here is 390 days of news. It's a 35 meter table with all these molecules connected to the software, with which that I mean connected by software. And yeah, so, sorry, this was supposed to be before that. Anyway, so another s memory project using coding system is uh, Serpentine Gallery, London. Smell and memory and coding. Last year, uh, two years ago, the uh, Serpentine Gallery make every summer an architecture biennale by one famous architect. This was Herzog and Dumouraz and Ai Weiwei. And they call the pavilion this, the pavilion of memory. 
So it literally memorized all the previous pavilions that have been over the last 10 years. So they commissioned me to do the memory of the memory. So this is the inside, the elements from all previous pavilions. This is Hatsog into the left. So this is my contribution, which is a replication of some of the smells in the materials and adding some codes on my own, so to say, giving it a smell what didn't have a smell. Another project similar to that, which is even more extreme, because, you know, starting point is always a reality in my work. And these projects here, partly and partly not. This is the most difficult work I've ever done in my life. Not only because of the topic, but also because I didn't have any clue how the battlefield in Vondel was smelling. This is the new museum in Dresden. The German government decided to rewrite and reinterpret that part of the history. So this building normally would be a monumental building nobody could touch. They cut it in the middle. Daniel Libeskin made a construction there to show we want to change. And in the different field, the different areas of that history, they did a completely new interpretation and rewrote wrote part of that history through young uh, international historians. So I got the job from the government to make the smell of the battlefield of Wando. And uh, yes, uh, what do you do? You know, um, I don't try to, uh, I didn't want to, 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 to make something something you know nice and, and easy so I got access to the most incredible in, you know molecules I ever could have access to one of the molecules was so extreme it was sent to me from the US with a box like this and the bottle was like two centimeters they were afraid <coughs> to explode in the airplane and the whole plane would stink anyway I composed a smell I had an army to my disposal so I had references how they could you know, how they explain that, and that of bodies and that of horses, etc. This is the first ever time in war that mustard gun was used, etc. So I had a, lit a history books and army to my reference. And I built up a smell that was so disgusting. The government said, no way we're going to have this on this place. People would throw up and say, yes, but what do you want? <laughs> Rose garden? Rose garden or reality? So if you don't want the, this smell, I'm out of the project. So they closed up the project. They put the whole project online to open it up for everyone to apply because it's state money. Nobody applied. They came back to me again. Okay, my talk, Ms. Tolles, can we discuss it again? So Mrs. <laughs> Merkel, everybody came to my lab. and said, listen, by the way, we cannot have so extreme. I said, yes, but it was extreme. What do we do then? So back and forth, you know, in the end of the day, we had an extreme smell and uh, I have a 15 years old daughter. I, my lab is at home. She had many kids coming and going. And whenever these kids smell this smell, they say, oh, World War One. <laughs> so that is the reference. So this is my smell on display at the museum. You literally open the door, you push a button, <coughs> and to the left, there's a bucket where you throw up. <laughs> because at the beginning we didn't have that bucket, but people couldn't make it to the toilet. So you thought, okay, you better you better take the consequences. And I said, that's really bravo, German. Germany, you, you understood the point. So in this case, uh, yeah, it's a tough smell, but it makes sense to be tough. So what do I do further with memory and smell? These kids are smelling matter. I collected, oh, I had one molecule which I patented <coughs> for that purpose. I wanted to see if we have small, small, easier and cheaper tools to learn with, would that change something? So here, smell, function, and improve rendering and memory of my sometime advanced knowledge. So they learn in the context of one specific smell, and whenever they smell that smell again, they think mathematic. So we tested if, you know, after a week, how much did you remember from this session, let's say. 
and it's incredible. We are now doing uh, small prototypes, how the smell can be used for different purposes of learning. So these are workshops around that. <coughs> Nothing stinks, but thinking makes yeah. it so. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> smelling before I read my newspaper, before I have my coffee, as part of my daily life. And uh, if I don't keep those 350, 400 receptors fit, nobody is going to pick my fit, you know? It's not enough to smell perfume, you know? We live in a world where we, we marketing perfume is, is where we are, uh, what smell concern. You know, I think it's a shame that, uh, that uh, yeah. If we can smell fear, can we smell love? Love is abstract. <laughs> <laughs> we can smell excitement, yes. But science also proved that this is the case. But we need trained noses to do this, yeah? But it's like, when people come to my lab and, and interview me, which I, they do a lot, I ask them the first thing, yeah, did you smell the staircase when you came up here? Oh, I forgot about it. You know? But I remember the smell from my childhood. Yes, of course you do, because that's the first time you smell that smell. The rest is a reference, you know. So that is the case. When I come up the staircase, I remember what I smell, you know. That's why also getting it in with children for me is so important. You know? My daughter is the biggest nose I've ever had come across. You know? It's like unbelievable. I also been collecting her body smells since she was a baby and confronting her with different stages in her life, uh, her identity through, you know, through the nose, and making her aware that you have a smell idea so as important as your fingerprint, and you know, like, mommy, I need a deodorant. I said, yes, but why? Because everybody, I said, but that's not a good argument, you know. <laughs> if you find out who you are, maybe how you smell before you decide to cover up, you know. But that's with everything, you know. I think that we need more smells not because it's not about being dirty or not. Yeah. This part of the world it's sanitized, deodorized, camouflaged for your kind of protection. By doing that, we are removing so much important information. You know, it's like what justify that? Like, like I said at the beginning, what justify for clean the floor with the smell of Granny Smith? <laughs> for God's sake, you know, why don't we clean the floor with dog shit smell? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, it's as perverse, you know. So the whole discourse around what's justified for good and bad, you know, cleaning up in India means different than in my home country, Norway. And we seem to have lost that train, you know. Globalization country, there's so many levels, but in this discourse, very little, yeah. you the, uh, the big companies, they still, they still, you know, sell the same product all over the world instead of working, you know, geographically on site and do research on site. It's, it doesn't happen, you know. As if we know what's good and what's bad. The whole hedonic discourse is just stopped. I'm oh, sorry, I'm a little bit... <coughs> yes? Um, I just can't help but wonder, and I'm sorry to be intrusive, but like because you talk about smells as like, the, the only way we know smell is like through perfumes, so it's more like decorating, like hiding, and it's not really reality. Like what, sorry, but like what smells do you surround yourself with? Like do you wear deodorant? Do you no, I never ever wear a deodorant in my entire life. And I hardly use any, I mean, not because I don't, I mean, not because I was aware about what was going on. I was born in Norway, Iceland. It was not, uh, you know, I never, never 
so the necessity somehow, you know. But that is not why I do what I do, because of those <coughs> kind of reasons. Um, I surround myself with so much smell molecules in my lab. As I said, I work at home, so it's like always some <laughs> smell coming across, whatever, for whatever purpose. Yeah, but it's like when you work with the nose, you also close and open the door, you know, the nose as much as you, you know, would do when you hear me work with words or with, you know, image. Yes? Yeah. Um, your, your work is very unique and participative. I mean, your workshop and your installation. And I also, also I see a kind of humoristic and ironic uh, critique of capitalism or com commercial stuff. And the, certainly the, uh, the smell are like um, subjective and cultural. Um, my question is on that way, um, how much or you can we manipulate or have an influence if I am manipulate with smell? No, no, um, it's possible to I'm manipulate with smell. Manipulate with smell. Oh. That's what the industry think they do. But yeah. I mean, uh, you, ma you can manipulate with mm -hmm. everything yeah. if that's a discussion. <laughs> Don't you think colors can manipulate? I think it's not right that as soon as you say you work with smell, you mean, oh, you manipulate. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's right. Okay. Of course, some, a lot of people want to manipulate, and yeah. they maybe use smell for that purpose. But again, you know, if we had a humanity, if we had educated people that know what the nose knows and the nose can do and what the chemistry of smell is about, we would have a completely different take on if those kind of issues. So rather than going on in that kind of discussion, directional discussion, I say, listen, education, education, education. You know, we can, it's hard to repair, you know. It's hard to repair all these prejudices, all these, Cliches, all this. Oh, I'm so tired of it. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, oh, you manipulate people. Oh, yeah. No, I don't. I don't manipulate. Yeah, I, I don't put it to say that. No, no, I don't yeah, say yeah. that as an answer. I just. But <laughs> I, I'm thinking of the, the David Beckham uh, piece of, kind of piece of art. And it's, it's a kind of, there is an oscillation between what is a piece of art and what is a commercial object. I don't care. And you don't care about Not why? at all. Why do you For do God's sake. Huh? Listen to <laughs> For God's sake. I use creativity as my platform to show my questions. End of the story. You know? Whatever comes to my mind, you know, of questions in the field of smell and society and life, I come in the museum, a like university or a company to say to sh let me showcase my approach to that, you know? Finito. Art, science, art, creati uh, uh, design, architecture, creative world is an amazing showcase. You know, it's an amazing platform. It's the only profession. Doesn't matter what you study as long as you deliver. You know, that's a lot of freedom. In science, you don't have that freedom. <coughs> Sitting in my lab doing, you know, all these tests with mouses and rats. No way. Smell is about life and human beings. So. I become a kind of catalyst between <coughs> the commercial or the corporate world <coughs> and the science world. A lot of scientists are using me to ask that question, you know. And collaborations is about that. I'm not interested to do art science work. I'm interested to get access to, to methodology and, and you know together we ask the questions and I have the guts to maybe take the responsibility. I don't care about these things anymore. I never did, actually. I tried to work with galleries. Oh my god, no. <laughs> I don't sell this kind of stuff, you know. Look, MoMA project was like a good example of how that doesn't work. Yeah. So then you have to take consequences. What do you do, you know? You go on trying to be an artist or trying to be whatever. Yes. <laughs> Suffer and, you know, and, and uh, you know. Yes, if your knowledge, what is prime here is that you have a solid knowledge. <coughs> if your knowledge is, is, is so solid, it doesn't matter you know, which context you present it. You know exactly the rules, you find the rules. I modify my, talk, you know, my talks for TED, I modify my talks for Mercedes, and like, you know, 
for, for total or whatever, you know, I have no problems. But I wouldn't work for FBI. <laughs> <laughs> when I did my project at MIT, I got approached by the FBI, of course. It's great. And DARPA, of course. Would you be interested to help us track a terrorist by this man? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, but now I know they have devices on DARPA, you know, that first rolled everywhere. We did a World Congress of Synthetic Biology in Stanford. There were like five DARPA people in the front row come up to us. There was Everybody is like, come on, here are, the, here are the millions. It's so easy, you know? So to avoid that kind of stuff, you have to find your way, you know? But I don't think it's a gallery, it's the final solution. Nobody survived from art in <laughs> Not even Olaf or Eliasson, I'm sorry. <laughs> His solar lamp make more money than his water. Yeah. No, I mean, it's all fine. It won't do. I mean, I just speak from my own experience, you know? But I think if your knowledge is worth it, it should be everywhere. Yeah? Yeah. And in the case of smell, it is everywhere. Yeah? I could have gone into all the research project about, about Learning, I've done thousands of different projects like that, and and the sleep project we're doing now, and others, you know. But it's just as much one can. I can speak more tomorrow. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering when you're composing a smell. When do you um, decide at what point the smell is ready? But the noise is the most sophisticated uh, tool you have anyway. So computers, are, I mean, electronic noises and devices of any kind are just a tool on the way, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you have the source, and you know how close you, because you never can get, as I said before, there are much more molecules in reality that I have a chemistry to do this the reproduction. So it's always the peaks you are copying, yeah? And then around that you can, you can, um, you can build, you know, as close up as possible. But it's very, you know, I want to say one thing. Smell and language. You know, I'm working on a project now with three scientists at the Monk's Planck Institute in Germany. They have done a fantastic project about smell, uh, 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 linguistic, they are linguists, and, and uh, language, and come up with amazing results. The paper is not out yet, but we are continuing a collaboration. And it's all about, you know, finding languages where there exist precise terms and expressions uh, an abstract expression towards smells. And I believe this is possible, you know, absolutely. I have a question in regards yes. to this exactly. Um, <clears throat> in terms of your uh, observations when you uh, ask people to document, or not, not document, I mean um, sh share what they uh, feel or how they describe the smell, is uh, what did you observe when it's um, body-related smells? Um, against or compared to the ones that are more cityscape and more kind of like external or less intimate in terms of uh, the how, how they describe this experience. Because smell is so direct. And, uh, <coughs> and the less you, you think, the less the more abstract the words are. So it's very phonetic. Like, like you say, uh, in German, I don't know how to express. If you want to express that the, 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 the red is more than red, you add a word. You know, you understand? Like, it's very abstract. It's like, intuitive, you know, it's amazing, you know, and uh, that's especially when I did in Liverpool, uh, I was astonished how much similar noises or voices or whatever came out of people in certain neighborhoods towards the same smell, you know, <laughs> and having access to the knowledge of the industry, I am, and through that, I am able to reproduce certain smells endlessly for the purpose of understanding and also for the purpose of language yeah so let's say I make a workshop with children in my lab which I do a lot we go through the city smells in my lab decontextualize from the city and the kids start oh that's disgusting oh that's awful oh that's oh that's interesting the third workshop oh oh wow that's quite something you know and beyond the notion of hedonic like this is good and this is bad and that's it you know I don't let that so when we get to the point, it's interesting. Then we start, you know? And having the possibility to reproduce the smell again and again for that kind of purpose, that's, that's where there is hope, I think, also for language. 
But it was also in regards, like, w w when you had the T-shirt um, yes. uh, workshop, for example, you know, like, words <laughs> came up, like, macho, and it was much more of um, attitude-wise. Yes, it was but that was, then you already, that's uh, already, you have the figure, you had the body, yeah? So you know what's about, if the smell were decontextualized, yeah. the result would be completely different. Completely different. Because here you saw the body, you knew it was the person. So you look and the yeah, truth of the an, look, there's an yeah, it's kind of, different, yeah. but still they were asked to it's a concentrate. In a way. Yes. <laughs> so that's very, it's like the cheese, if I don't tell is a Bill Gates uh, put, nobody would <laughs> care, yeah, or whatever, yeah. Or if I have a smell of a homeless person in my lab at a beautiful table or North Berlin in a beautiful bottle, you know, they don't see where I got the smell from. No, as soon as you put the other senses into play, we have completely different take. And there it's, that's what, that's my key, so to say. Yeah? That's my uh, secret. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I needed the knowledge of the industry, to be able to do that. Yeah? Hopefully one day they will understand it. Thank you so much.